Good morning. Good morning. It's a happy day. We're back in the building. I am not Guy Swan, but I am replacing him. So I just retired as the Army's Inspector General. And as the new panel comes up, I'm, I'm going to introduce Fred Muro first, and then he'll talk about the panel that's coming on board. When I had a chance to, to look at this topic, it's one that's really important to me as being a senior commander myself and thinking about those threats to critical infrastructure. So, so Fred is an Army engineer, and I like Army engineers. He's got on his Army engineer red tie. He has a master's degree from Stanford, so that means he's really smart, in water resources and civil engineering. And still today, even after retiring from some several positions there, he still does interim public works in Carmel, California. So let's give uh, Fred and his team a round of applause as they come up. Thank you, sir. Um, as we were putting together uh, this panel, um, we we thought about it in a, in a couple of ways. One is we, we've talked about a lot of the requirements. So we thought we would move into, in this panel, start talking about, well, what are we actually seeing? What are the real threats that are being seen on the ground? And what are the different methodologies that those threats are occurring? Uh, you've heard a few references to them, but uh, we'll drill into that a little more. Then we, we thought we would go, okay, inside the fence line. What's, what exactly is happening inside the fence line with a particular emphasis on cyber? And that'll be, be covered by, by David from uh, Booz Allen. Um, Jonathan will kind of give us an overview from Converge Strategies in terms of the attacks. And then we've got the real key person in the show, uh, and that is our fill-in. <laughs> Captain John Klein retired uh, because Mr. Coe, who was going to be talking about what were we seeing outside the fence line in the way of transmission, had a family emergency. So John raised his hand and said he would like to be part of the combined arms team and have the Navy bail out an Army guy at, for this panel. John will uh, will talk about um, what's been going on outside the fence line, but with kind of a focus on what's happening inside the ins installation fence line that's being pushed outside. Where is it that we're actually starting to see this teamwork that is sort of referred to in the Army installation strategy with regards to that reliance on partnerships being one of the two key pillars of future installation success. So that's how we're going to approach it. So we'll start with Jonathan giving sort of an overview. Fantastic. Uh, do you have a uh, trigger puller by any chance for slides? Oh, there it is. Thank you. Okay. Fantastic. All right. Good morning, everybody. Fred, thanks so much for assembling the panel. The discussion so far has been fantastic. I'm hoping not to derail that and just keep that those good vibes going right now. So that's the intent. So I wanted to spend a couple of minutes just talking about DCEI, Defense Critical Electrical Infrastructure Program. So in Michael's absence, it's just kind of the opportunity to highlight really how the Department of Energy and, and really the broader picture of private sector partnership comes into play here. A couple of things that I wanted to highlight. So we're obviously talking about the threat environment. It's very difficult to avoid the pitfalls of running down the rabbit holes of individual threats. Suffice to say, I think the key thing that we really wanna highlight here when we talk about what energy assurance for mission assurance actually means is being able to adequately mitigate for those potential consequences associated with a wide variety of risks. When we talk about cyber, obviously it's, it creates unique vulnerabilities in a number of different ways because it's not easy to see. It's not easy to see until it hits you. And so that in and of itself really calls to action the need to look at these no notice events, look at these kind of dynamic threat environments in a way that translates to the types of infrastructure planning and investment and ultimately execution that's necessary to support those mission assurance outcomes. So when we talk about the homeland no longer being a sanctuary, a great example is when we look at Winter Storm Uri in Texas just last year, you had a circumstance where out of 14 DOD installations, 12 out of 14 lost power. All 14 installations experienced disruption to water services to those installations. 
that's not the batting average that we're shooting for, right? That's exactly what we're trying to address is figuring out what it takes to make sure that there are no mission assurance consequences associated with events of any type. But certainly when we look at a circumstance like that, there was no massive infrastructure damage. There was no nation state cyber attack. This was really just plain old fashioned cold weather. And so if that's the type of thing that can put us in an operating condition that sees 12 out of 14 installations without access to energy, that's a big problem. So looking at it from the, you know, the attack perspective, in a lot of different ways, it's easier than you think. And I don't mean that to say that there aren't brilliant people working on a number of different solutions in this space. The fact of the matter is we have to be much more proactive about how we identify and quantify these risks, but then also what we're doing to really address them systematically. And so when we talk about the systematic approach, we, we can't do it without discussing these types of interdependencies. So when we look at Texas as an example, the availability of natural gas was fundamental to the challenges that they saw in terms of outages on the system. The availability of those types of assets because of interdependencies with things like water systems that depended on electricity in order to continue their operations, all of these things are entwined. So we really have to look at it holistically if we wanna be productive in our approaches. So these are kind of some shocking numbers or maybe they're not shocking to you at all. But when we talk about DOD dependence on private infrastructure, 98% is not a small number. <laughs> So if anybody was wondering, it's a huge number. And so the challenge that we have here when we talk about what it takes to bring these services on the base, inside the fence line, on the installations, these numbers are never going to be zero, ever. There will still be dependence on private infrastructure to make these things happen. That's not, a, that's not intended to be an Achilles heel, and it shouldn't be. All it really does is highlights the fact that how we articulate these requirements to the private partners that are involved in these processes, how we actually identify what the needs of the department are in each one of these areas is really the first and most consequential step to making sure that the systems that we're dependent on are going to be available when we want them to be available. And so that really helps us try and articulate what these types of needs are, and it sets us on the necessary path of figuring out what the, the, the actual planning criteria what the actual requirements are going to be. So I'm gonna go forward and then backward, essentially here to talk about this overlap between operational energy and installation energy. And it was raised this morning to, to great effect to understand that if you look at energy, right, from an installation perspective, you have to look at it differently. It is an extension of the weapons platform. They are not two different things, they are one thing, right? And really, overcoming that mental hurdle and recognizing that operational energy and installation energy, a lot of times what you have is a bifurcation in terms of command, in terms of planning, in terms of execution and funding. And it was raised earlier, right? The, the commander says, well, you know what? That's an installation problem. Nope, that's an everybody problem. So trying to understand how we do this really relies on a concept called mission decomposition of saying, I want to do this thing. And in order to do this thing, I have to identify the infrastructure, assets, and performance capability of the same to execute the mission itself. Not just existentially like, hey, I wanna do flight line operations, or hey, I need to do motor pool operations. Yeah, but what do you need in order to do that? And that's where I go backwards to this one, is if you look at this layered approach of saying, all the way down at the mission level, it's not just that you need to do that thing, it's what infrastructure actually supports it. And it's also not a binary choice. It's not saying, well, the lights are on or the lights are off. Yeah, but how long are the lights on for? How quickly do you need that power? Do you need it immediately? Or do you need it for 24 hours? Do you need it for 48 hours? Is it the 14-day model? Is it longer than that? And so essentially looking at it from a mission perspective changes it from like it's all resilience everywhere on every single piece of equipment and every single stretch of infrastructure, or are you actually using it as a targeting mechanism to come up with the performance criteria and capabilities of specific sets of infrastructure? Mark said it best, and I remember working with Mark when I was at PJM, really trying to articulate this. Say, DOD is uniquely positioned and the Army is uniquely positioned to define infrastructure performance requirements in a way that no other customer is. Conveniently, the Department of Defense is the single largest rate paying customer on the planet not just in the United States, but in the world, there is no single larger rate payer. They are uniquely positioned to say, it's not just that I need electricity, it's that I need the infrastructure that supports explicit and discrete mission requirements 
to do the following things, certain tiers of redundancy, certain levels of hardening, all of these things can be baked in in a way that utilities understand, integrates with their planning processes and goes back to what Sharon said, OPM, other people's money. This has to be a blended investment model. If everything's inside the fence line, it's all on the Department of Defense to fund the whole thing. There are definitely unique contracting mechanisms available to do those types of things, but the blended model of saying there's inside the fence line and outside the fence line investment that can be made also takes into account, I know Fred's passion, which is the communities that surround these installations. All of those civilian employees and military family members that live off the installation and oh, by the way, the critical services, medical, police, fire, that are right outside that fence line that could also benefit from the type of blended investment that meets both requirements, mission assurance and community resilience. Could you leave that slide up a second? Sure. I'm curious, how many former senior commanders do we have in the room? Okay. How many of you ever thought you would be worrying about that list of things on the left side of this slide? <laughs> and how many? <laughs> Two hands. And, and how, <laughs> how many went into it, went into that command position thinking about that issue? How, how could we better uh, I'll call it inform, educate, whatever you want to call it, our senior commanders so that they are thinking about this as well as propelling their core or their division uh, to the war front. Because uh, this is a critical part of their job and they need to be talking to that, to that, to those issues with their state leadership, with their community leadership, with their utility leadership, because that's all part of mission assurance that we very often don't think about. So, but with that, could uh, we go over to David inside the fence line on cyber? Yeah, thanks. Can I see the, uh, the trigger here? Great. Make sure I've... Okay. okay, great. So, you know, what's what's pretty cool is is um, when you're sitting in the audience at the early part of the conference and you look around and you kind of survey, who's going to ask me the toughest questions when I get up there on my panel? Well, when you when you determine that person's John Klein and you're preparing for that, and then John Klein ends up next to you on the panel, no <laughs> questions for me, right? We're on the same team here now. So, so that 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 was something that uh, that I think kind of gets me off and running. But, you know, I, I really like the opportunity to follow uh, Jonathan to talk about critical infrastructure with a particular emphasis on cybersecurity, and and I'm gonna. I'm going to show a couple of charts here and that are going to kind of team me up for the rest of the discussion. And I, I want to let you know that I'm thinking about the Army installation strategy, thinking about the engineers on the base, thinking about the action officers on the base. So when we kind of set out to prepare for this panel, you know, I made it clear to Fred that this is where I'm going to come from. So I'm going to kind of get in the weeds a little bit on the on the second chart here, because I really want to offer some practical thoughts on where we are now. The, the guidance that we're getting from the administration and from the, the uh, defense establishment. And what do we do with that guidance and how do we make it useful, right? Because we've got quite a challenge in front of us. So when we, when we really further examine this problem about cybersecurity threats on the base, I want to start by breaking it down in, in three ways. No, no surprise to anybody here that we have increasing attacks. Okay. We have increasing attacks because we have a, we have a, dramatically increasing threat landscape. Everything's smart, everything's wireless. The dark web and the tools and sophisticated approaches that our adversaries have grows and increases on a daily basis. And there's more and more opportunities for them to disrupt. We'll talk about what disruption really means, but simple disruption, sophisticated disruption. But nonetheless, we need to accept the fact that, that you know, I used to say it's, it's not, it's, uh, uh, it's not if, but when, but we need to assume that it's happening now. Continuous developments in the threats, continuous attacks, it's happening now. So when we're thinking about being on the base and you're an action officer, you're a base commander, assume threats, assume attacks are ongoing. Every mission we have, every simulation that we do, every preparation that we have is, is trying to be hindered in impact so that our mission, our mission readiness uh, is degraded. The complexity of the threats continues to, to increase. But a lot of that complexity is created by ourselves on the base. We're dealing with legacy systems that many times were purchased and installed with no intention of being secure, okay? 
So almost every installation is faced with the, the great majority of control systems that that weren't intended to be wireless, that, that weren't intended to be secure. And what do we do? Well, we recognize that we need to do more and we need to do more faster. So we overlay wireless and some secure control systems and expect them to interface with those that are not. And then we assume that an air gap means that it's secure, but we don't account for the third party vendors that are coming in to fix those control systems. And what are they connected to? And what are they plugging into your systems on the installation? So the complexity of these threats it's changing every day. And that's compounded by manpower, resource, training, skill set issues and challenges that every single installation faces. OK, our, our civil engineers and our action officers on base, they know the mission. They understand the importance of this problem set, but they usually come into the seat with little or no experience in dealing with control system cybersecurity. So that's the complexity. But then we have the mission driver, right? Our appetite for data our appetite for smart systems, our appetite to do more faster, right? So we have a growing threat. We have a complexity from day one. But nonetheless, what we want to do in spite of that to support our mission continues to grow. And this runs across all of the sections of critical infrastructure, okay? Weapon systems. Sometimes we overlook the fact we're just not dealing with, you know, uh, HVAC and, and fire and emergency services. Absolutely, that's what we talk about on a daily basis. But more and more, our critical C4 ISR systems and weapon systems are, are on our installations. Installations and bases, as you well know, are warfighting platforms. They need to be looked at. And cybersecurity is really a foremost example of, of where that applies. So where are we now? OK, uh, this is we have executive orders that talk about control system cybersecurity. The, the National Defense Authorization Act for 2022 came out with a Section 1305 that specifically focuses on mission-relevant terrain. And it begins to guide the services and the DOD organizations and NSA to take specific actions to understand the threat environment around control systems. And that's great. Okay. So I, I view, and, and, and I think many of you also view, that the bridge from NDAA uh, to actual execution is, is really built on the installation commander, the, the action officers in those directorates, the DPWs, and the civil engineers. So what are some of the things that we need to be doing now to really kind of get off and running? Well, inaction is not an option. Okay, so the Army installation strategy really needs to include emphasis on a few different things. Clear specifications. We talk a lot about specifications and guidelines um, for smart IT and OT. This is a fast moving train. What we're dealing with last month isn't going to be what we're dealing with tomorrow. And certainly it's going to be different than what we're dealing with in five, 10 years. We talked about 2030, right? Being prepared for 2030. What's 2030 going to look like? Okay. Understanding the external dependencies, like the Fred teed up inside the fence line and outside the fence line. You know, I want to be an inside the fence line person. Okay. But one of the key components of being able to secure inside the fence line is knowing what's out like outside the fence line. Where are your partnerships? Okay, partnerships has got to be a main theme here on the base. And asset inventories. Upwards to 80% of, of asset inventories are incomplete. Okay, so, so when people talk to us, when I'm on a base, regardless of the service with the client, we start with what do you have? What's most important? What are your crown jewels? Okay, have you validated those things? What kind of exercises and training are you doing? to make sure you know what's most important. You can't secure everything the same. You can't fund everything the same. What are you gonna resource? Technology and digital innovation is key, okay? But there are some things that, and some important considerations that go along with that. Integration, okay? Integration is, is paramount. It's, it's an exciting opportunity that we all have to interact with one another on the industry side. <clears throat> there are more and more technology vendors bringing important and needed solutions to this problem set, okay? But there, there is a potential for too many technologies. So our ability to align and integrate, making smart investments is really key. Defense in depth, okay? Sensor to SCADA, understanding the Purdue model. Where are your sensors? What's the network look like? What's your IT and OT convergence? Okay, so defense in depth. You know, one or two technologies probably doesn't get you there, but an integrated approach to using technologies wisely is, is a direction that's going to allow you to pursue defense in depth. And then standards and synchronization. So where are we going? The future's 5G, okay? 1528 in the NDAA sets out to 
provide specific guidance on, on I'm sorry, on, on zero trust. Okay. That's great. But when you look at the first couple of bullets here, we, we have a long way to go in most installations to, to ensure that we're ready to actually execute zero trust. Least privileged, continuous monitoring is a requirement. Uh, different requirements for asset visibility. So, so these are things that are, are important considerations. So I, I, I do want to underscore that uh, it's a very important time to understand the threat landscape. Uh, the attacks are real. It's, it's a matter of time. You, you can't just wait to be attacked to do something about it. So I, I really hope that one of the things that we walk away with specifically focused on the Army installation strategy is we walk out of here recognizing what are we doing now? What aren't we doing now? What can we be doing? Okay, and what are the what's the low hanging fruit that needs to be taking place now on the basis uh, and have those specific discussions? High level guidance is great, important. The DOD strategy, the direction we're heading in is, is important. But what we do with it at the engineer, on the installation, at the action officer level is going to be key. And that starts that hadn't started yet, it needs to start today. Thanks. Thank you. Um, you know, when we were starting thinking about this panel or, and about this whole session, it was really thinking about partnerships, as you've heard a couple of times. And we need to transition our thinking. To date, most of the intergovernmental service agreement type partnerships that started in 2013 have really been focused on saving money. And we really need to do what this whole program is about is that's partnerships for mission assurance saving money is nice it even may be a necessity necessity given appropriations but we need to be looking at these continual opportunities for for partnerships to make sure we can put combat power where it needs to be and move it from the base so john if you could talk about some of the uh, i'll call it outside the fence line things that have happened and particularly highlight some of those partnerships where we were actually from the base helping the the grid, so to speak, because we seem to always focus on what's the grid going to do for us. But if you could speak to that uh, in your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Push the button. There we go. Can you guys hear me? All right. Um, thanks. Thanks, Fred. And uh, happy to be here. And I. Um, as, as I start this off, there's some colleagues of mine that are in the audience that, that will be able to help with this presentation. And um, I think Monica D'Angelo is back there. And I see, and I know that um, Randy Monahan was here and Mick Wasco is also here. So I, I'll need you guys probably to help me. And then Ivan Bolden is here who who really taught me about IGSAs and, and the importance of partnership and then my ESCO colleague there, TW. And so that all, all, all of these people and these partnerships are gonna play a role. But before I start, I, I gotta foot stomp what David said about the importance of cybersecurity. And when I joined the Navy, and I, I am another Navy, uh, recovering Naval officer, when I, when I joined the Navy, I, I was told, hey, you're a safety officer. Well, we need to begin to have that mantra of every officer is a cybersecurity officer. It's not the IT's guy's job. And so I want to stay that here. I wish I had had that idea when I was wearing the uniform. I didn't. I thought that was the IT guy's problem. And, and really, it was my problem. And I didn't understand it. And the air gap is not a solution. And now that I'm, I'm consulting and I'm out with the Army, I hear often from senior mission commanders, oh, we have an air gap. That's okay. No, all the more reason to pay attention. And so th this is something that cybersecurity we incorporated in this story I'm going to tell you it, about Groton, Connecticut. And it starts with uh, Superstorm Sandy. A major northeaster came through, knocked out power in New England. Well, it knocked out power at the Navy's most important submarine base in Groton, Connecticut. And when you lose power to a submarine, that is a critical event because the submarine is nuclear powered and you need to maintain power to the coolant pumps. Now, it's not going to be a catastrophic meltdown or anything, but people have to, you have to recall sailors, you have to get power to the submarine and you have to get it now. And so that, that happened, but it became an event where the Navy said, oh, resiliency to installations is important and it doesn't have to do anything with green power it has everything to do with resiliency and it was also important to the community so we embarked on this journey of how do we get resiliency at groton and 
we didn't have any money to get resiliency at Groton and nobody was going to give us money. But we found the path working through really smart people that, that I pointed out earlier that we can get there through partnership. So we work through the Ascent Association of Defense Communities to get partners and to array what authorities are available to us. And then we looked at other people's money because we didn't have any money. What did we have? We had land. We had a number of state grants and authorities from that. And so we we put together, we worked with the utility company and the community to establish an enhanced use lease for a natural gas fired fuel cell. Why did we pick a fuel cell? Is because the state was providing financial incentives for a fuel cell. And the fuel cell was the only thing that would fit on this land that would provide direct power. So it was the right technology for the right solution. And we you got there through an enhanced use lease. We did the microgridding on the base to get the power to the submarines through a green grant from the state. And then we integrated that power to the barracks through an ESPC project. So what I want you guys to take away is that the, the, oh, and let me back up. The utility company wanted the power source on the base because the base was important to the utility company. The local mayor lost power to his community during Superstorm Sandy. So he wanted to use state authorities to establish a microgrid for his city of Groton. So in this story, everybody wins. The Navy gave up a little piece of land that they weren't going to use anyway for power generation that supplied power to the submarines. The And we were going to buy that power anyway, but now we have a, a source of power that's behind our secure fence line. The community got the excess power. We used state money to build the microgrid. We required all our partners to make this cyber secure because we knew that was important. And so it, it's this partnership, but it, it has to, the only way to do that is open dialogue. It has to, the installation community, the, I'm sorry, the installation commanding officer has to be intimately involved in it. The mission commander has to care because he's the guy that that's, has to execute the mission. And without that, without all those people sitting down at the table every day, and somebody from headquarters has to be involved because there'll be bureaucrats that want to stymie the effort. But every day, you got to sit down and talk to these guys. So, so that's the Groton story. And then Randy and Mick did a really great project at uh, Miramar with the same idea just on the other coast. Um, Mick and Randy, do you guys want to stand up and tell, quickly tell the, the Miramar story? Please? I'll buy you a beer. <laughs> oh, they're going to, okay. One that I think you talked about was Yuma. Yeah. So that great. so the Yuma story is the sim, very similar to the one you talked about for the Navy up there for, for the subs. We have the Joint Strike Fighter in Yuma. So what we were able to do is partner with the, the utility. It was a it was a win-win for both of us because they needed the power and we needed the power. So we've had probably, I think we're at 220 outages and the base has never gone out. We've had a base-wide control system that our base has never gone out. And we've had experienced many outages throughout the community, but because we have that relationship with the community, um, we get the power first, and then they then they send it back out in town. Thank, thanks, Randy. And it's all about establishing what that win-win partnership is right up front. What are your objectives, and ensure that everyone wins and that risk is balanced appropriately because risk and reward have to be um, equal and associated. Thanks. Uh, if I could foot stomp a couple of things that you've heard here, the partnerships don't often occur naturally. <laughs> they will only occur if forced. And I've got to tell you that the, the person wearing one or more stars on their shoulders has a lot of impact in helping the locals understand the importance of this critical infrastructure because 
In the military, we're kind of used to unity of command. There is no unity of command outside the fence line. <laughs> I mean, you have a huge array of potential partners that need to understand your needs, and they will do their best if they understand them to try and respond to them. Uh, or last week, Ivan Bolden was visiting from the army out in California, and I know he was talking to some of our state folks, helping them understand the necessity for the state of California to create its own little DSIP program, program to ensure that there are state funds available to help communities with the matching grants that go into DSIPs. I mean, that was a great investment to have somebody from DA uh, actually talking to civilian leadership in Sacramento because even though he's not wearing stars on his shoulders, he carries himself as though he were. And, and, uh, and it does make an impact as compared to a city manager saying, hey, we need this for my base. So uh, that is really, really important that you help the communities, the states, the public utilities, the local municipal utility, the council of governments, there's all of these players. And as you'll hear in some of the later panels, you'll hear some how some of those partnerships worked uh, to help fund stuff on the installation. So a foot stomp on that. Uh, John, could you talk a little bit about the Navy's approach to create infrastructure, excuse me, microgrid infrastructure on your installations? Because you have a whole bunch of Navy installations that already have their microgrids in place when it's an Army goal to have them by 2035. What, what's the difference? You all work under the same EUL laws, the same, so how have you mastered that in the, in the Navy when you were still wearing that uniform? That, that's a great question. And I, I think in the Navy, we have a little bit different structure there where the, there's unity of effort because the installation commander and the uh, and NAFAC are closely aligned. In fact, the chief works for uh, Commander Navy Installations Command. So, so the, the, the Civil Engineer Corps, NAFAC, is completely aligned with Naval Installations Command, whereas the Army Corps and MCOM are a little bit different. There's a different model there. I'm not saying it's bad or good, but there, there's, there's not that quite that alignment. And then the, the other thing that's complicated that we don't have in the Navy is you've got this senior mission commander that's on the army base and he owns a lot of the buildings and owns a lot of the budget. And so we've got to find a way to, to help every, the garrison commander and the senior mission commander see that that alignment to achieve the army climate goal and to achieve the, uh, to achieve the energy resiliency goals is in everyone's best interest and everybody needs to move forward together. And doing that with the community is the way to go. And I, th I think one of the things that, that Ivan did really well in San Antonio was that huge IGSA umbrella for, for with all the governments in San Antonio to provide base operations support for, the, for those communities. And that, that example where, where you had buy-in from everybody, that's the kind of alignment we need to get the um, the microgrids at the Army installations paid for by somebody else. That actually was at Fort Carson that the Army ah, did that. Uh, but there is a very similar IGSA at Joint Base San Antonio that is actually with the Council of Governments as opposed to a local city. Thank you. But it's it's using, it's marrying up those IGSA tools with the other authorities. Um, I'm, a question for any or all. Um, could you comment on the specifics for taking the presentation concepts we've seen today outside the fence line with proactive local governments? What would you see is, is the best way of, of taking what you were saying today to city managers, to mayors, to council members, and so on. And that was actually a question asked by an assistant city manager. Yeah, I, I love the question because I think you said it very well. The, the partnerships just don't happen on their own, right? They're, they're not just gonna, they're not going to be the byproduct of luck. 
it's going to take that proactive outreach in order to be able to do it. And I think a lot of times what the, the leadership from a community standpoint, just outside of the fence line, what they're really looking for is something concrete that they can build around, something that they can actually rise to and meet. Community members, I have yet to meet a single one that says, we don't like our installation partners. We don't, we don't like having a base in our community. Essentially what they wanna do is they wanna find ways to support the installation. The hard part is they just don't know how to do it in a proactive fashion because of the complexities associated with the different funding streams, the different colors of money, and there's not a uniform approach from an installation perspective across the services as to how these requirements are identified, defined, and communicated to those partners. Of being able to say, it's not just that the community wants to support the installation and the installation wants to partner with the community. It's saying, here's actually a, a, a very, very specific set of things that we really need. And it also helps them in the process because it helps them understand what types of funding sources are they eligible for. John, I can't even imagine the process that you had to go through to identify state grants, to local grants, figure out the nuance of all those different programs, eligibility requirements, how that mapped against individual pieces of infrastructure. And the hard part is the, the spirit, the intent, and the process is something that can and should be scaled but the hard part is there's going to be nuance for every installation. And what we really need to do from the service side is make that process as uniform as possible so that you don't have to try and start from scratch each time you want to do it. So I think the more specific you can be about what you need and how you get there, it also gives them top cover for utilities. They have to get those rates approved. They have to get those investments in front of the state commissions in a way that they can understand that translates to the way they can see value and ultimately move forward with a project like that. Thanks, Jonathan. And I, I think the we've got to get comfortable. I say we like I'm still in the military, but the, the, the services have to get comfortable with having these kinds of conversations about what their needs are, having very frank conversations with the community, and the community is going to want to help you. And one example I want to throw out is uh, my, my former boss, Lucian Niemeyer, is in the room, and he it, he caused a very important conversation to have with the city of San Diego about Sandag and the very important development that needed to happen with the NAV war complex, where they that that very important mission for cybersecurity for the fleet needed to get recapitalized for a whole lot of reasons. But if it wasn't for Mr. Niemeyer's senior level discussion, it, th this this project wouldn't happen and probably his continued involvement. I'll, I'll pass it over to you, sir. <laughs> Actually, we were smart enough to get Lucian on that. <laughs> Lucian will be on the next panel to talk about that. Sorry. Uh, could um, any of you speak about, I'll call it some of the help that is available to communities to uh, to actually look at their infrastructure, uh, like what you did in Alaska, uh, what was done with Jack Votek with the Armor Cyber Command, and and just talk about some of those tools that are available to communities, if you know if they if they ask for them, uh, Jonathan. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this is a, a necessary bridge that we need to cross, which is. The OLDCC, the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation, has a lot of grant programs that are out there right now specifically for the purpose of engaging those community planning organizations for the purpose of understanding what these potential resilience risks are in a blended model of inside and outside the fence line and, and knowing how you can assess these systems, how you can prioritize projects. And so if you look at programs like MER, the Military Installation Resilience Report, thanks, Fred, I almost got there. Uh, an example here is it's a great program that in, that provides funding and planning resources to go out and look at communities. The challenge right now is there's not a uniform approach, right? It's it's up to a local planning organization to submit an application, get approved, and go out and do it. But they get to do it and really without the defined set of criteria, like what outputs of that program are going to directly advise infrastructure investment on the installation and with the community. What is it that they're looking for? The assessment methodologies can be different in every single community that applies for one. There's not a uniform set of standards that says use these assess assessment methodologies that are mapped directly to outputs that can be directly inserted into any one of these funding stream models, whether it's ERSIP, whether it's O&M money, whether it's installation money, whatever the circumstances are, the hard part is 
that disconnect right now is is the primary encumbrance to really being able to get some of these things done. But there are resources available, and it's a great way to conduct that outreach to a community to say, look, there are planning dollars out there that can help us assess where these vulnerabilities exist, and we can use that as a roadmap for execution. David? Yeah, to add to this, you know, I, I, I go back to how we started our meeting today talking about the deployment from Fort Stewart. So that that movement of a brigade from Fort to Port th to the Port of Savannah, I'm a veteran of the 3rd Infantry Division as a logistician, so I I lived it. But that's that's very important when you when you look at it from everything we're talking about here, but from a cybersecurity perspective. OK, a lot of the threats that we're facing are our port facility systems and 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 I've possible, you know, fuel system malware attacks and and all of the things that along the highway and transportation systems that that get you from base to, to the port. That is a that is a huge partnership. And and when I think of that, I also, you know, I noticed that, that Colonel Lamb is here. We need to train like we fight. And uh, at an ADC conference uh, several months back, we we did kind of this mini war game where we selected a specific resiliency scenario and we had community leaders and installation commanders and emergency planners in the community. And we talk specifically about, you know, in this move, you have to displace 100 civilians. How are you going to do it? Where are they going to go? You've just been hacked and, and all of your, your emergency management systems went down. The, the, the heat in the gym where you're housing, everybody just went out. So these are the things that we, that partnerships allow us to do. And, and we need to be focused on in our training and preparation. Uh, Fort Stewart, it's, it's really great that that's been mentioned a couple of times. It was actually an exercise done called Jack Will Take. It was planned uh, and executed by the Army uh, Cyber Institute. Institute at West Point. ACI. <laughs> at West Point. Using uh, a, a model uh, called the Decide model that allows distributed uh, wargaming. Uh, there's a little information on all the packets that you have there. So there's the footstop for the commercial. But as military folks, helping your installation partners outside the fence line realize that, you know, we need to exercise together, too. Uh, Dan mentioned earlier the deputy garrison commanders, about 10 of them, I think, are meeting at ICMA next week. And we're going to talk through a number of scenarios and I'll introduce them to the decide model. But very often it's going to be the installation leadership convincing the community leadership that we ought to be doing joint exercises above and beyond the active shooter at the gate scenario. We, we do pretty well at that. We do pretty well at mutual aid responses on fire. But thinking about those other critical partnerships that are going to be necessary when the grid goes down is, is really essential, I think. John. Yeah, that was one, great. One, Go ahead, John. One, one thing I wanted to add to that is a, as you're planning for resiliency, one of the, your first stops should be your servicing u, utility company because they have access to a lot of great contracts already negotiated through GSA that you can do a lot of stuff with them. And I, I'm sure uh, Monica is going to talk about that later on in the panel. But but first stop, utility company. And I like the idea of, of doing war games with the utility company for resiliency. So thanks. Um, a question from the audience. Uh, how does the Army measure and report installation resiliency? And how do they use this information to make investment decisions? Anybody got an answer for that? Yeah, so something I would offer up is, um, I, I think more often than not, people take resilience as a all or nothing proposal, a binary, you're either resilient or you're not. And I think that in and of itself kind of gets to the heart of the question of, of how do we measure success in terms of where we're going with it? And so the earlier discussion talking about looking at essential missions, looking at mission assurance, looking at discrete requirements that are specific to the types of things that the installation owner and the mission owner really want to see executed. And not just because it'd be fun to execute, but because there are O plans that are actually designed specifically requiring that they be executed. Those are really your benchmarks and your metrics to try and figure out whether or not you've achieved the level of resiliency that you want. And so trying to identify that as the end state and your ability to execute those are essentially a, a, a function of the availability of the assets and personnel needed to execute. And so until you have that set of discrete criteria for what the performance of infrastructure, the availability 
of energy that you need in order to execute it and the availability of personnel, you'll never really have a good sense as to whether or not progress is being made in that particular area. And that's where I think, again, the wargaming piece comes into play. Black start exercises was mentioned earlier. It's really, really interesting to see what happens when you have a, a plan of execution or you have that, that diesel gen set that's hooked up to a building and you've got the steps that were outlined on paper, but then you have to execute when the plug is actually pulled. That fundamentally changes kind of the nature of the conversation and the assessment as to how resilient are we right now? Well, why don't we find out? And, and I think there's an opportunity there that that's not always taken advantage of, especially when those types of exercises are scaled back to fit really what people are confident they're capable of doing instead of really making sure that those are opportunities to learn and say, like, it's not that everybody gets a gold star and we got 100 percent. It's that we learned where our true vulnerabilities are. And now we have a better sense as to just how resilient we are. David? Yeah, just a, a quick add to that is uh, we, we have to validate that we're, we're measuring the right stuff based on the threat. You know, for example, we're pretty good at, at, at uh, IT and desktop stuff from a cyber perspective. Not so good at non-desktop stuff, right? We talk about OT and ICS, how important it is, but we're not so good at measuring how resilient we are. So time to kind of upgrade where we are. What's the threat? What do we measure to really determine our resilience? I'm sort of curious. Um, we have a lot, of, a lot of legacy systems uh, on our installations. I mean, we privatized energy systems and water systems years ago, and that was really to essentially improve them so that they were what they should have been when first built, uh, as opposed to what they were and how they deteriorated as a, lack, as a result of a lack of investment. But at the same time, those were old contracts and they were normally firm fixed price contracts. What are you seeing today in terms of contracting, I'll call it capabilities or needs? Or should we be talking about energy as a service rather than a contract to run the grid? Should we? Is there a way we can take some of these legacy contracts and restructure them in such a way that they are much more responsive to the commander's need for resilience and mission assurance? Jonathan? Yeah, one example. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, one example, I think, is um, an underutilized contracting capability for OTA, Other Transactions Authority, specifically as it applies to energy. It's used in a number of different ways for everything from, you know, uh, vaccine development to, you know, parts for the space program. But it really hasn't been leveraged to the degree that it's capable of doing specifically for the energy question right now. And it, uh, it enables a lot of conversations that right now with the the, the lead time of traditional contracting models, the, the constraints that exist on the conversations that can happen between the Department of Defense and vendors, um, that's that's a potential breakthrough there to really just yeah. understand that the scale of investment necessary to hit the 2030 goal, the 2035 goal is in many regards not compatible with some of the existing contracting mechanisms. You can make progress. It's just a question yeah. of can we get there yeah. without it? Because yeah. the, the scope is never the same by the time you actually award the contract. Uh, David? Yeah, I'll, I'll second the OTA process and the ability to, to provide quick turn solutions, engage with the government on them as you go. It's 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 really it's pretty innovative. We need to sustain it. But, you know, uh, on that, uh, Fred, and, and I've I've compared notes with Lucian on this and, and I think John might agree. But I spent a lot of time talking to my commercial counterparts at Booz Allen. Because when we look at cyber resiliency on the base, we're dealing with control systems that are similar to a lot of our commercial industry manufacturing, right? So a lot of the solutions and the way we buy them um, uh, are, are, are should be similar. So I think that this is a real opportunity, resiliency for a, a company's uh, commercial campus or a base installation. There's a lot of synergies there. We need to kind of leverage that that partnership. Okay. Jonathan, as an add I mean, John, as an add in at the last minute, you get the last word because we've just run out of time. So make it a short word, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, th thanks for having me. And the, my, my short word is I, I think partnerships are important and that you can achieve your objectives through partnering. And don't forget about cyber because you can achieve cyber objectives through partnering and uh, certainly with the communities because they have the same need for cybersecurity. Thanks. Thank you all, appreciate it.